Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And we are so happy to be coming to you live here from a brand new studio. And I am personally thrilled with the fact that we're also back live again here at 10 a.m. It seems like it's been quite a while since we've been able to do our show in our normal way live here at 10 a.m. But today we're sort of back doing all of this. And boy, you know, over the course of the next couple of weeks, we're going to kind of do some more things to sort of add to our little array here. But uh, just great to have the original Golden Shoe back in the uh, studio again. Kind of a new look for Eddie here on the desk. Some of the uh, Dog Nation artifacts that I've collected over the years as a Georgia fan. Some of the things that you've actually given to me. Uh, a lot of that kind of stuff going to kind of appear on the walls here. We're sort of still in the little bit of the build-out process on some of this. But we can't wait to kind of show all this off to you here over the course of the uh, next couple of weeks. And by the way, let me also say this. A lot of folks have helped us get ready for this. Many of you know I've been out of town the last week, and so while I've been gone, uh, you know, Jay Black and Cody Chaffins and Michael Carvel and Kaylee Manziel been in here working so hard to kind of get ready for all of this. So many folks from our uh, parent uh, company here have been kind of really just bending over backwards to try to give us what we need to do this show. And we're kind of nice enough to sort of give us this wonderful uh, building. This one, you know, We always talk about our Dog Nation World Headquarters. I don't know that we've ever really felt more like a world headquarters than it is right now. If you've seen my uh, Twitter over the course of the last you know few days, I kind of showed off some of the control room. We are certainly living in a much nicer space than we probably deserve, at least that I probably deserve. But, boy, we are so glad to be back talking Georgia football with you here today. And, by the way, before we're done, I'm also going to show you something really fun from my uh, trip on Icon of the Season. I think you'll really like this. It'll give some of you a chance to laugh at me, which I know that you will enjoy. But the business at hand, though, is talking about Georgia football. So what do you say we get ready to do that? It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. Viewed to be the best. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. DT, one of our commenters there at DogNation.com, said it is good to be live again. And yes, indeed. It feels very good to be talking to you after a week away from me, or at least a few days away uh, from me on board Icon of the Seas. And here in a brand new studio, we're just showing this off to our video folks, say, a little while ago. If you're podcast, radio, this may not mean quite as much to you as it uh, does to them and to our live audience, the chance to be able to stream this and just sort of, uh, you know, kind of put it out there to the world the way we've come to expect. We are so happy about being able to do all of that. Now, all the things you've come to expect from our show, you've still got all of that. It's John Stinchcomb later on. It's a look around the rest of the SEC later on. And it's a deep dive, of course, on Georgia football, as you have come to expect. Now, let me confess something right here off the top. We'll kind of roll into the show here today. I love doing this program. In fact, one of my favorite things about my life is, is that when I have a chance to be away for a few days, I don't have that sort of like, what do you call it, Sunday scaries or like the little feeling of dread about, oh, I got to go back to work. I don't really have that. I'm always very, uh, uh, you know, excited and eager to get back and doing this show again on a regular basis. I'm very thankful that I feel that way, but I must admit when I was kind of sitting, and I was actually at WWE SmackDown when this went down. Um, so I'm sitting there at uh, State Farm Arena for SmackDown, and you get the thing on the phone, and you start realizing the texts are blowing up, and everybody's talking and chatting, whatever else. You realize that Caleb Downs is not coming to George, as we all expected that he might, and, and probably was. He is instead going to Ohio State. There was, for me at that particular moment, a little bit of, Okay, good. I don't have to talk about this for a few days because at that point in time, the pre-recorded shows were kind of all in the can. Uh, we weren't really dealing with that live as it happened, but we knew we'd have a chance to come back and talk to it. So for a few days, Caleb Downs going to Ohio State, not coming to Georgia, was not necessarily my problem. And I have to say that I was kind of happy about that, you know, not having to sort of die because the show is never as much fun. When you're talking about bad news, it's never quite as good to be doing something like that. But the other thing here is, is when you have a few days to sort of simmer on something like this and kind of think about it, I think I've probably come up with a couple of thoughts that I don't know that I necessarily would have had, like, right in the moment that all of this went down. Now, I totally realize that this is a little bit more new for me than it is for some of you. You 
were not on board Icon of the Seas last week, I don't believe. And so, therefore, you've had your time to sort of make peace with the Downs news and sort of figure out what that meant for you, GA. I'm a little bit of a sort of last guy in on the fray on something like this. But let me try to give you a couple of fresh ideas in terms of what I think this means for Georgia and kind of spin this forward here a little bit. By now, many of you are aware that the story of Downs, the former Alabama safety, choosing Ohio State, comes with the idea that Ohio State has just spent huge dollars on its NIL. There was a big story in the Wall Street Journal the other day. A lot of the other outlets sort of picked this up. I want to show you this from our friends at Front Office Sports talking about the uh, the, uh, the the piece here. And this is what Front Office Sports writes off of the Wall Street Journal piece. Then in the days following Michigan's win in the college football playoff, Ohio State is reportedly spending at least $10 million and perhaps $13 million in name, image, and likeness money to retain and add key roster pieces. The numbers are unconfirmed. Everything with NIL seems to be. But the, the story goes on to say, but the frenzy surrounding the Buckeyes has still grown to the point where it's captured the attention of the Wall Street Journal. Ole Miss head coach Lane Kiffin and legions of fans across the country. Houston Texans quarterback and former Buckeye C.J. Stroud has also become, quote, a major donor to the school as it ramps up for next season. So that's what front office sports said about the uh, Ohio State Buckeyes allegedly spending all this NIL money because from Ohio State's perspective, it's time to win right now. And this is where, for me, this story becomes about so much more than just Ohio State wrestling away Caleb Downs because this becomes, I believe, the important template for how college football works, broadly speaking, in the big picture. Why is it that Ohio State feels so much pressure to win right now? Why is it that the Buckeyes are more anxious and you know kind of on pins and needles about getting this done than they perhaps would have done in the past? The answer is obvious. The uh, quote we just gave you from Front Office Sports uh, talked about that in pretty plain English. The issue here is that Ohio State saw its hated rival Michigan win the national championship. And now Ohio State, after a couple of years of not beating Michigan, not winning the Big Ten, not having nearly as much success kind of post-pandemic as it had in 2020, and, you know, you know, going obviously kind of paling in comparison with the Urban Meyer era would have been for Ohio State there as well. All of a sudden the Buckeyes are saying, and perhaps the Buckeyes boosters are saying, enough is enough. We are sick of watching Michigan celebrate. We can't let – another year go by without competing at the highest level ourselves, and that is what uh, apparently is motivating all this from the Ohio State standpoint. Now, I find that to be really interesting. And this is where, as I said before, this becomes far more than just about what is happening with Caleb Downs. This becomes about the ultimate motivating factor in every college football program. The thing that motivates you more than anything else, it's not – chasing the the pleasure of success it's avoiding the pain of watching your rival succeed if you want to kind of sort of boil down college football to its basic essence and if you really want to understand what makes the sport the sport and what makes the sport the kind of thing that so many of us have sort of devoted our lives to as our number one pastime or our, our occupation or whatever else the reason why so many of us become college football obsessives is because of that simple point the thing that drives college programs to success is not trying to obtain the pleasure of what it feels like to win. It's about avoiding the pain of watching someone you hate win. Rivals are motivators. That is the ultimate essence of the sport. And Ohio State is motivated right now because Michigan won a national championship. So therefore, allegedly, we'll go out and spend a million dollars on this and a million dollars on that and blah, blah, blah. We'll, 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 we'll go out and do all of that because we saw Michigan win a national championship. And if we understand that as just sort of universally true for our sport, I think it puts Georgia in a pretty interesting spot here right now. Because Georgia is in a very weird realm with some of its rivals. On the one hand, teams like South Carolina and Tennessee that we would sort of think of as kind of lower-tier rivalries with Georgia, those games are no longer going to be played on a yearly basis anymore. You can have the argument of, well, is it still a rivalry if you're not playing it every year. It may be a competitive series. It may be an emotional game. But if you're not playing it every year, is Georgia-Tennessee still a rivalry? Is Georgia-South Carolina still a rivalry? And if that's true for those two, 
you kind of wonder where this leaves you for, like, say, the Deep South's oldest rivalry between Georgia and Auburn. It certainly seems like right now there is a very good chance that in the future world of the SEC, this league is going to hold on to its eight-game conference schedule. And if it does moving forward, that means that there will not be a Georgia-Auburn taking place every year. Now, I believe that the history between these two teams will – uh, lead you to believe that Georgia and Auburn will still be a rivalry, even if they're not playing every year anymore. Uh, you know, not playing every year anymore, but it is going to feel different. There is no doubt about that. And by the way, Auburn hasn't been very good lately. The kind of motivation that that Ohio State feels because of Michigan's championship success, Auburn can't provide that kind of pressure for Georgia right now because for a long time. Auburn hasn't been good enough to do that. That's also true for the one team that we know that Georgia will always play, and that's Florida. When we started the Gator Hater Countdown and the Gator Hater Updater, and we started doing all that kind of stuff, bringing Eddie on the set and doing all those types of things, when we started doing that, the idea behind us doing that was sort of based on the notion that, hey, you need to challenge yourself with the toughest rival that you can find. And calling Florida your top rival over a program like Georgia Tech, which barely ever wins anything, was so much more advantageous for UGA. It gave Georgia something more to aspire to by thinking of Florida as your biggest rival, more so than, say, your in-state rival like Georgia Tech, which is not really a program that competes at the same level. But while that may have been true when we first started preaching all of this, the truth is, is that Florida has fallen on such hard times right now that even they are no longer possible to sort of put the pressure on Georgia that Ohio State certainly uh, feels right now from Michigan because Michigan won the national championship. If rivals are motivators, it is certainly worth noticing right now that Georgia's not getting that obvious natural motivation from its rivals, the Auburns, the Floridas, because they're not very good right now. Now, I don't think that's going to mean the rivalries are going to go away. It just means the extra boost that a team like Ohio State's perhaps getting because of what Michigan has done. Georgia's not currently getting that. But I think that creates an opportunity for UGA as we move ahead into this new era of SEC scheduling, that Georgia has a chance to redefine itself a little bit, which doesn't mean that you completely forget your past. But I do think in this new year, a year of so much change in college football, it gives you a chance to embrace the newness that we're about to all experience. And Georgia can, I would say, add to its list of rivals just a little bit more and start treating a couple of other opponents a little bit more like traditional rivals in a way they really have not been in the past. Let me give you kind of a final point on this to sort of boost what I'm trying to say. The other day, ESPN.com was doing not an SEC list, but a full college football list of all the things they were excited about for the upcoming college football season, kind of an early, way too early look at what's going to happen here in 2024. And this piece, sort of written by a number of ESPN writers, kind of focused in on uh, some of the games that were the most exciting for the upcoming year. And it only mentioned eight games. Across the entire country, only mentioned eight games. But of the eight games that were mentioned, two of those – involve the Georgia Bulldogs. And so if the point we're making here is, hey, in 2024, Georgia can kind of redefine itself by introducing itself to some new rivalries, ESPN.com seems to be kind of boosting that point itself. Let me first of all show you what uh, was said by Chris Lowe about the Georgia-Alabama game. Uh, coming up, obviously, September 28th, one of the biggest games of the year. And what uh, Lowe kind of points out is it's only the fifth time in the past 20 years that these two SEC powerhouses, he called them, have played in the regular season. Georgia and Alabama historically have not been much of a rival, uh, haven't been much in the way of rivals. This has not been much of a rivalry because the two teams just don't play very frequently. Uh, as Lowe says, just uh, five times in the last 20 years. But in the new look SEC, Georgia and Alabama are going to be playing a lot more frequently. And for Georgia, that could be a good thing because Alabama, even with Kalen DeBoer at head coach, right now looks like a much better program than Auburn or Florida, the more traditional rivals for UGA. And if you get motivation by fighting against a tough, you know, competitive rival, well, Alabama might provide that for UGA. And obviously, September 28th does stand to be a really big game there. Now, some of you kind of already think of Alabama as one of Georgia's rivals. I certainly understand that. There is another team, though, that I don't think any Georgia fan has necessarily sort of historically thought as a rival to UGA, but moving forward in the new look SEC, this is a way that Georgia has a chance to define itself. This is a program that can become 
a rival to UGA. Once again, this ESPN.com story mentioning uh, the game coming up against Texas on October 19th. Adam Rittenberg's the rival, I should say the writer here, and he says of this Georgia-Texas game that Georgia will likely enter the season at number one with an excellent chance to win its third national title in four seasons. Uh, he says, but a midseason trip to Austin is going to tell you a lot, though, especially if Texas can build on its breakthrough 2023 season with quarterback Quinn Ewers. And that's sort of the point that I, I want to f- uh, focus on for a moment. You can take that down now. Thank you so much. But in the case of Ohio State, when it looks across and sees Michigan, it sees Michigan having something that Ohio State doesn't currently have, and that's a national championship. It's a motivation because you're watching your rival celebrate. And if Georgia wants to redefine itself here in 2024 and truly embrace the new SEC, well, one of the easiest ways to do that with some new rivalries is going to be played on a much more frequent basis. Georgia and Texas have only played one time ever before in the regular season. That was, I believe, 1958. But the point here is if you want to embrace these new games, these new opponents as rivals, then the easiest way to do that is to look at them the same way that Ohio State looks at Michigan. It sees the Wolverines as having a national championship, something right now that Ryan Day doesn't have. Georgia can look at Alabama and say, you're the reigning SEC champion. We want that. You can look at Texas and say, you were in the college football playoff this year. That's where we want to be next year. We think we should have been there in 2023, but we want to be there for sure in 2024. You were there. That's the kind of motivation that rivalries can provide. Now, historically, Georgia and Alabama, this has not really been much of a rivalry because the two teams don't play very much. Georgia and Texas almost have never existed within the same orbit. But embracing those two programs as rivalries and embracing those two teams as rivals moving into the new year, I think for Georgia that could be a very powerful dose of motivation to get the dogs right back where they want to be in 2024. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We're glad to have you with us here today, live across all platforms, and of course, brought to you by our friends at Pella, Window and Door of Georgia. So it's great to be back on the radio, Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref. Great to be back across all video platforms here today there as well. How much fun is that? And of course, podcast. We certainly appreciate your loyalty to us there on the podcast platforms there too. And so thankful to our friends at Pella, Window and Door of Georgia, for making it all possible for you here today. Energy efficient windows and doors, that is what Pella Window and Door of Georgia is all about. As I'm sitting here in a new home right now in our brand new Dog Nation World Headquarters studio, I'm reminded about those of you who have new homes that you're living in there as well, how great and cozy those new homes feel. And so many great builders around our area are choosing the Pella Windows and Doors as they are building because, in fact, when I drive through new neighborhoods and things like that, I see the Pella sticker all the time. Because this is the best way for a builder to show he's taking the best possible care to build the best home possible. And if you're a homeowner and you want to take the best possible care of your home there as well, then getting those Pella windows and doors is a great way for you to do that too. So stop by and see them at their Experience Center in Duluth. You can put your hand on the product and find out what makes it different and better. You can also give them a call, 678-638-1429. That's 678-638-1429. Or you can see them online. Pella of GA.com slash dog nation. That's Pella of GA.com uh, slash dog nation. Take advantage of great savings, all kinds of fun things going on. Just make sure you tell them that BA from Dog Nation Daily said they would take good care of you because I know that they will. Pella Window and Door of Georgia is viewed to be the best. All right, so we told you before on our show, everything for the most part kind of the same way you've come to expect it in the past. That means our buddy John Stinchcomb coming up here in a moment. But for those of you who watch the show, Got a chance to see John's face on a more regular basis now, which is something we really enjoy doing. We'll get that with John here coming up in a couple of minutes. Prior to that, though, I want to go around the doghouse. And I want to talk a little bit more about the Downs thing just for a moment. Now, here's where I'm going to get myself in trouble with some of you because what I'm about to say is going to come across a little bit as like spin control. You know, we're kind of in that sort of political season. It seems like everything is a political season these days. But you know what spin control is, right? You take the facts and you sort of spin them to make it sort of be a little bit more appealing to your base, a little bit more favorable to your friendlies. And what I'm about to say here is going to come across that way to some people. But as a way of pushing back against that, I want to kind of start by just being very candid and very honest. Obviously, we wanted Georgia to get Caleb Downs. We spoke about this over and over again. We believe that Downs is truly one of the great players in all of college football. We're very much on the record about all of this. And 
as a way of kind of bolstering that. Let me play you a clip we've already played for you. That's Kirby Smart going back to December once again, talking about how good Caleb Downs is so the record can be complete and fully understood that when we talk about Georgia not getting downs, we're talking about a very good player choosing to go elsewhere. That's a fact. That's not in a dispute here right now. So let me bring the Kirby Smart clip back into evidence here. Kirby from December on just how valuable a commodity Caleb Downs as a safety can be. Take a listen to this. He don't look like a freshman at all. He looks like a guy that's been playing for three years. Um, he's instinctive. Uh, he's fast. Uh, he's fearless. Um, he's everything that he was in high school. I mean, we got to see him. I've seen him play about 107 on seven games at, at our stadium and at our facility uh, when his high school team came over here all the time. And he's everything that uh, that we thought he was, punt returner. Uh, he's just a football player that is instinctive, great tackler, um, just what you draw up when you want a, a defensive back. So there you go. So that's what we know. In dispute, Kirby Smart right there, that's how good of a player Caleb Downs is. So we understand that. But that said, Caleb Downs also would have represented a luxury for UGA. It would have been luxurious to have both of the best safeties in America. As it stands, George will have to settle for having one of the two best safeties in America. Downs is a great player, but Downs would have been a luxury for UGA. And now that Downs has chosen to go elsewhere, I think this does provide a little bit of an opportunity for UGA to do what it really needed to do the entire time anyway that it's fun to kind of have your eyes on a luxury. And if you have a chance to obtain luxury, of course, almost anyone would want to do that. But there are also necessities. And focusing now on the necessity for Georgia, I think becomes even more important in light of the Downs news that we've all had kind of a week to sort of simmer over here for a moment. And the necessity for Georgia, as you understand, is fixing some issues there on the front end of the defense. It would have been great and luxurious to add a player like this to the back end of your defense, but it would not have changed. What we've said before is Georgia's most important need for the new year, and that's some issues there on the front end of the defense that need to get back to looking a little bit more like what Georgia has looked like in the past. Let me give you a couple of numbers here just for a moment. If, if you look at rushing yards per carry allowed for UGA, this past season, Georgia was just 37th in the country giving up 3.77 yards per rush. Compare that to 2022 when Georgia was third best in America in terms of rushing yards uh, allowed per carry. In 2021, they were second best in that same category. So a huge drop from second to third down to 37th here this year. Same thing when it comes to another category and stat where like defensive line play is really important when it comes to tackles for loss. In 2021, Georgia was 10th in America with 101 tackles for loss. In 2022, Georgia was 20th best in America with 91 tackles for loss. This past season, though, 2023, Georgia drops down to 65th best in America with just 72 tackles for loss. So you could put Caleb Downs on your roster. I don't know that it necessarily changes those two issues. Georgia needs to be more dynamic up front defensively and just frankly a little more stout compared to the very best versions of Georgia in back-to-back -back national championship seasons of 2021 and 2022. So the bottom line on all of this is simply it would have been great to have a luxury product like Caleb Downs on the Georgia roster, but the presence of that luxury would not have changed Georgia's necessity. The overwhelming need to get better with your defensive line, to build a defensive line again that looks a little bit more like the kind of thing that has led Georgia to national championships in the past. And now that the down story is over, Georgia can spend its time focusing on what truly matters, the true necessity for this program, which is what it's going to do up front. That is around the doghouse here today. We're going to get John Stinchcomb here coming up in a moment. Prior to that, though, many of you know I just got back from a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation on board Icon of the Seas. I'm actually going to show you something really fun from that before we're done today, but it also gets me excited about our Dog Nation cruise coming up in April, and it gets me really excited about knowing that we've got a couple of days left for you to register for your chance to win your way on to the Dog Nation Cruise, Allure of the Seas, courtesy of our friends at Kroger. Now, by now, hopefully you've been registering. I've been telling you about this all while I've been gone, but it's really, really important that you take advantage of these final couple of days to get on board with all of that. So here's what you need to do. Go to dognation.com. It's right there at the top of the page. Easy to click into, easy to get in, uh, you know, going there on that. And all you got to do is just give us your information and also tell us your favorite memory from Brock Bauer's career here 
at UGA. Do that. Let us know that. And if you're the winner, uh, you're going to get a stateroom for two, you and a guest. Uh, you're going to get a hotel room in the Port Canaveral area the night before the cruise leaves. That's on April 21st. A gas card to help you travel towards Port Canaveral. And, of course, some onboard credit to enjoy while you're on board Allure of the Sea. So someone's going to be a lucky winner. Super easy there at dognation.com to share your info with us, to give us your favorite Brock Bowers memory. And then one of those entrants going to be selected at random. Uh, that's going to be our winner, you and a guest, on your way on board Allure of the Seas coming up with us there in April. Really, really fun giveaway, courtesy of our friends at Kroger on all of that. All right, so before we're done, you're going to love some video of me. Those of you who like making fun of me and laughing, you're going to really have a chance to do that here coming up in just a moment, especially if you're live on video and if you're on audio. We'll describe this to you hopefully as well as we possibly can. But for now, on everything as it relates to Georgia, kind of what's next for you, GA, as it kind of moves into a little bit more what feels like the true off-season on all of this, let's get ready to bring on our great friend, uh, the former UG All-American, a Super Bowl champion. Obviously, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming big game with him there, too. It's John Stinchcomb today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Boy, great to have John Stinchcomb here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia today. And great to see John's handsome face. You're talking about ratings. You put that mug on the screen, you're going to have uh, all the folks tuning in to see a little bit more of him. John, you're always so kind to be a part of our show as we kind of usher into a brand new era here. Uh, you're also kind enough to be with us live on video. I certainly appreciate that. It's great to be talking to you back live here again as well. I'm not hearing okay. John. There, now I am. Go, go ahead, John. Right, yeah. yeah, go ahead, John. Thank you for that. Um, and I look forward to, you caught me with the hook, so I'm going to stick around because I want to see these pictures from the cruise at the it certainly has me waited with bated breath, B.A. We'll certainly do some of that here coming up in a moment. I was just talking to you, or should, should say talking to our audience a moment ago, about what goes down with Caleb Downs. And by now, a lot of those folks have had a chance to sort of process some of that. So I tried to kind of approach this from a little bit of a different angle. You know, it, it is certainly true that Ohio State seemingly has chosen to spend big here. And the pressure of, uh, you know, Michigan winning a national championship, I think, puts the spotlight on Ryan Day. That's what you got to do. And as I said before, John, you know, this is one of the things that I think makes college football really fun and, and really special, which is that the the success of a rival kind of motivates you to kind of go out and be even better than you otherwise would be because you don't want to see that bunch celebrating anymore. So when you think about, you know, Alabama, who's the reigning SEC champion, Texas, who's now in this league after having been in the playoff a year ago, that's maybe perhaps all the motivation that, that – you know, Georgia perhaps needs now moving forward, knowing that some of these teams in this conference have something that we want, and it's uh, time to go out there and retake that for ourselves. Is that right? I think so. I think it, you, you look at the landscape that's been created, and specifically for Caleb Downs, he has an opportunity to pick and choose wherever he wants to go. And there are programs that have open, opened up their purse, purses and – been able to pay, and Ohio State's leading the way this offseason. You look at Judkins' pickup, now Caleb Downs. They're willing to spend to get some of these top names from the transfer portal. Now, if you're a Georgia fan, uh, would you want a Caleb Downs on your roster? Absolutely. But like you just said before I got on, on air, that would be a luxury. I think there's uh, bodies already training in Athens that are more than capable, and uh, that's a position of, of want and certainly not need. So uh, you would love to get a Caleb down, especially as a hometown kid from just up the 316 to where Athens is. And uh, from all accounts, one of the highest character guys in, in college football. So uh, certainly not somebody you think, oh, we, d we didn't need him any. We wouldn't want him anyway. But um, that's where we are in college college football and for Caleb himself you look at it and say you know he had an opportunity to come to Athens but you know my understanding is what what was being offered from Ohio State is significantly more financially and you know this is not free agency this is not the NFL where there's a salary cap so if there's other programs that are able willing and able to outspend others and still offer you know, that national landscape, the national recognition and, and potential to be relevant in the postseason, you know, there's a lot that makes sense for a guy like that. With that said, there's there's no program like Georgia's, and 
Um, that has certainly carried a lot of weight, not only with transfer eligible players, but those coming out of the high school ranks. What do you think about some of the stuff that's you know kind of being said about the big dollars that are being thrown around here? You know, the idea whether it's this player or any other player, you know, the allegations of other oh, spending ten million, they're spending thirteen million, they're spending whatever else. You know, a the numbers are getting larger and larger and larger in terms of what you're hearing, but b they're also not getting any easier to substantiate. What do you make of the fact that there is so much out there, you know, related to this that can be just completely, you know, no no ability to confirm it whatsoever. The reports are out there, but the actual tangible facts don't seem to be any more prevalent than they've ever been in the past. Oh, yeah. There's so much smoke going on that you can't discern what real numbers are. And, and uh, from my talks with Will Lawler this past week for the athletic board, we had a meeting about NIL and how that impacts student athletes. So, you know, you're sitting there with Tanner and Will and hearing about NIL opportunities for our student athletes, which are great. And it's hard to substantiate what's going on across the campus unless other um, compliance officers are sharing information that is accurate. There is no way to really tell what kind of deals are on the table. So some of these numbers that are floated out you know, whether they're substantiated by the player specifically, um, that's probably the most reliable way for guys, the few guys that have said I've received X amount of dollars in, uh, in NIL money. But for us on the outside, there is no metric, there is no site that is measuring. And my understanding is that's not a requirement. NCAA doesn't require, require it. Conferences aren't requiring to disclose what those NIL deals across uh, their student athlete portal uh, or, or what the, what's available to them. So, you know, that's another thing that uh, can either be a positive or a negative because I, I'm sure there's been a lot of players that uh, end up going places with expectations that are not met. And so, you know, it's hard to discern. I think as a player, you kind of have to weed through. Uh, what is what is true, what's available, and what might be a lot of smoke and fluff. Before we change the subject, if you don't mind me asking you, you know, having had conversations with a guy like Will Lawler and being on the athletic board yourself, what would you say that Georgia's message to its fans would be as it relates to NIL right now? Yeah, I, I think it's responsibility. And I think we're trying to, my understanding, having you know, listened to an hour and a half plus uh, presentation and ask a ton of questions is we want to be able to provide our student athletes, the university of Georgia does with the best opportunities for them to um, it, seek as they will. And, you know, there's other places that are doing things differently. And, you know, it's so hard because it's a little bit of the wild, wild west where there isn't quite the regulations in place. And we've seen the, the bar kind of move and shift as to what compliance uh, offices can do within the A program. I think you look at, at you know, what Michigan State or Miami or Tennessee or Texas A&M have done in the past. And it seems as if at times uh, what they're allowed to do and what uh, they cannot do has shifted. And so, you know, places like Florida State with uh, the Amarius Mims case, I think we're still recognizing there isn't the same level of consistency from program to program. But at the University of Georgia, it is, um, it's been able to recruit, recruit at the highest level, especially in the football, uh, football team, but across other athletics as well. As well. There's a number of, of players uh, in all the sports that are offered at Georgia that have been able to kind of maximize on their name, image, and likeness. I want to sh shift gears to what's happening in Athens here right now. And I always find this portion of the year to be really fascinating because, A, it's the time in which fans and media probably have the least access to Georgia football or just college football in general. And yet at the same time, it's also, I would say, one of the most important times of the year because this is where body transformations occur, especially for young players. This is where I think guys earn the confidence in the from the coaching staff to get the look that perhaps gives them a chance to earn a starting spot come spring practice. It feels like we are like in the most dead of offseason part of the year here right now because 
this is as far away as we'll ever be from the upcoming season in some respects. But, John, how important is this time of year for the players on campus? And by now, you know, so many of the signees, early enrollees, they've been here. They've been going through all this. What's it like on campus for this team right now? Well, I think it is an opportunity to make the biggest difference for the names that you already have in house. And there's a reason why so many uh, enro early enrollees want to be on campus. And it's because of the work that they're getting in the strength and conditioning program right now. You, you see the development of players. Let's remember that we're talking about 17, 17 18, 19 year old young men that are still filling out and they're still adding muscle and, and changing their bodies for a all the big bodies, the offensive and defensive linemen that came out of high school at 300 plus pounds, I guarantee that's not the same 300 plus pounds that they will uh, leave with. Uh, it, it may be that same number, but how it's put together is going to be drastically different than how they arrive. I, I can speak from experience. I've witnessed yeah. it. We continue to witness it, especially with the bigger frame guys. You know, one of the main challenges of playing national football, especially in the conference that we do is to be able to play in the trenches and those bigger frame guys, you, you have to be able to maintain that same level of speed while stacking on muscle and playing at a very physical level. So uh, what you see is right now is the opportunity that you can make the biggest difference in your game. We've seen it for players in the past of, man, this looks like a, almost a totally different player as they make, you know, so usually it's from that freshman year to sophomore year. Um, and then continue to watch that development as they go along. But I think as a player, this was an opportunity to make one of the biggest differences that you can in your overall performance just to buy the amount of work that you can put in into, you know, your, your vehicle and your vehicle is your body. So as you train and get ready, uh, it gives you, you know, six, seven months to get yourself as physically prepared for the demands of a, you know, these seasons keep getting longer and longer. So that's a, it, it carries a high toll. And now's the time that you prepare yourself for, for the price that you're going to pay. I've asked you this before, and I don't remember your answer. What was harder for you as a player, being big enough or avoiding getting too big? Yeah, my, my issue was always stacking on the weight. Yeah. I, I was the guy that, you know, during season, trying to maintain that, that weight was, was a challenge for me. And you know, you played next to guys that are looking at you with disdain. And at times I did the same thing of going, I don't know how uh, you, you keep the weight on, but it's all about maintaining the right weight, right? I mean, it's for some guys, they're losing muscle and for others, they're adding blubber. So trying to maintain that, that balance of, of good muscle content and still being at a weight that is effective for your position group is key. Would you in like fall camp, would you be, I mean, in danger of losing even more weight because you're sweating it all out? I mean, you know, the intense practices, the heat. I mean, was that a time in which you sort of felt like you had even more of that going on where, hey, I, you know, I may, I may be at so-and-so weight at 8 in the morning, but by 5 p.m. I've kind of sweated a lot of that kind of stuff out. And all of a sudden now I'm not being able to kind of move around Charles Grant quite as well as I would like to. Yeah. Is that something you would kind of find yourself dealing with? Oh, no question. I mean, there's practices you lose 13 pounds of water weight, but you're burning through a lot of calories. So mm -hmm. just being able to uh, replace those at times is a real challenge. And, you know, August for a lot of guys is there is their time to get down into their playing weight. And for others, like myself, it was a struggle to maintain the weight that you're going to need to carry you through, you know, the start of the next year. In the time we have left, I want to ask you about uh, kind of a cool streak that Georgia keeps alive. For the 23rd straight year, Georgia's going to have a player, you know, in the Super Bowl. Going to have another, uh, you know, at least two players are going to win the Super Bowl. There are five active players in this year's Super Bowl. Obviously, the streak is something you were a part of there for UGA. So, John, as someone who's contributed to this 23 straight years of a player in the Super Bowl, it's tied with LSU for the longest active streak right now. You know, what does this mean? At one point, to me, it was a little bit of an anomaly, but the longer it goes on, the more you're going to have to conclude, well, gosh, there must be something to Georgia's ability to produce talent if it just keeps happening every year and seemingly will happen for a number of years in the future, just given how many Georgia players are currently in the NFL. What does this streak mean to you as someone who is a part of it? 
Well, it's a, it's a point of pride. I think we all should take pride in it. And I think there were years where it was just uh, lucky spots on a roster, right? If, yeah. if there's only so many teams and, you know, we just happen to have guys on one of the two teams that's playing in the Super Bowl, then, hey, that's kind of a cool streak that we're a part of. But now I think it's a testament to the level of play that Georgia continues to produce and the level of player. So, you look across the, the league and it's filled with Georgia talent and it's because of Coach Smart and his ability to continue to produce NFL professional level football talent uh, that finds success. And, you know, look at the players that are playing this year. They're not just, you know, back of the roster fillers. You're looking at guys that, you know, play pivotal roles on their team. And um, again, I think it's a testament to where the, the program has move to and um it's something that we all can be proud of the thing i'm always fascinated by when you think about the super bowl and as i said before you have a super bowl ring coming from your time there with the new Orleans saints the thing that i'm always really fascinated by is you know as a football player you're obviously pretty famous right everybody knows who georgia football players are as an nfl guy you know everybody kind of recognizes a lot of these names but you're still playing with a thousand other teams on sunday at 1 p.m or saturday there's still a million games on when it gets down to the Super Bowl, you're the only game in town. It's the most watched sporting event or even really the most watched TV show for the entire year. Like, how much did you kind of feel the difference of, you know, this isn't one of all the games taking place on a Saturday or Sunday. This is the game, and the entire world is watching. How much of that was something that you were aware of when your Saints team was getting ready to go and kind of play in this game? Oh, we were acutely aware. Uh, you know, as you know, I played offensive tackle, yeah. and we're a team that threw the ball a bunch. And across from us with the Indianapolis Colts, there's two future Hall of Fame defensive ends that loved nothing more than to get after a pass, uh, pass or a quarterback. And you know, Robert Mathis and Dwight Freeney were nightmares. So to know that this is going to be the most watched TV event of the year by far and if you screw up, it's not just football fans, but also those that are just tuning in for the commercials. Uh, <laughs> I think we're all aware of that. So, you know, it comes with a lot of pressure, but it also, you know, when you're playing good football, it's that's where you want to be. You want to be on the, the brightest stage under the brightest lights against the best teams and see exactly where you're at. So it's, uh, you know, for all the alphas out there, there's no place better to be than on the big stage with all eyes on you so you can kind of prove that, that you belong. And uh, it's exciting as a player. It's a little nerve-wracking, and there's some anxiety involved, but it's, uh, it's a unique opportunity where you know this is, uh, this is a moment that will change your life. You know, it's, it's something that I, mean, I probably didn't understand the opportunities that would come from playing in a singular game. I played a lot of football games, but that one in particular sets you apart from so many others that that have played the game alongside you. By the way, on video right now, we're getting a nice look at some of the former Georgia players, a part of the Super Bowl, including a look there when they were in their Georgia uniforms, like Charlie Warner and Robert Beal. That's a nice thing to be able to see. John, real quick before we let you go, any thought on what you saw yesterday from the two games and the Super Bowl matchup that we do have? What stands out uh, to you from San Francisco really coming back against Detroit and the battle of star quarterbacks between Mahomes and uh, Jackson? How did you experience the football yesterday? Well, I enjoyed it. I, I missed uh, some of the games I was listening to while I was in transit. Uh, old Jerry Stewart, high school coach, who was a part of Parkview years while I was there and, and coached elsewhere. We had a, uh, a visitation memorial service for him, so I wasn't able to watch all of the games, but it was good to be around some other football yeah. minds, some of the brightest in, in high school football as we celebrated him. But the games that I did get to see – uh, you know, I, I played with half of the staff in Detroit. So Dan Campbell and Aaron Glenn and Mark Brunel, all those guys I saw as teammates. And now you see them as coaches and, you know, you just, you hate it for them on those fourth downs and that third down with, you know, Reynolds, a couple drop passes there and it's aggressive football, which is the only way I knew Dan to play it. And, uh, you know, I think it kind of bit them in the end. There's some questions. You go, eh, maybe we just take the points here. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of what you expect at this level of play is, you know, you're, you're leaving all your cards on the table. And uh, it, it's a big jump just to get to that game. Um, and so it's exciting to see for some of those teams, if I'm going to be candid, 
Uh, I didn't wasn't exactly keen on watching Kansas City return once again. I was kind of excited for some of the underdogs, yeah. the Baltimores and Detroits to get those opportunities. But, you know, it's it's a game that you have to earn the opportunity. And I think San Francisco and Kansas City did just that. John, I tell you what, it's great to speak to you. I really appreciate you being here as a part of uh, Dog Nation Daily presented by Pella Window Indoor of Georgia in our brand new studio, by the way. You look great. We're thankful to have you. And we will look forward to plenty more fun conversations coming up with you in the weeks ahead. Well, if I look great, it's a lot of smokes and mirrors, and I appreciate the new studio more than you know. Uh, but I appreciate it, B.A., and go dogs. Thanks, John. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Proof. How much do you love John Stinchcomb, man? I tell you what, a great guest, a great guy to talk Georgia football with. And I'm always really impressed, and we've done this now with John for a good number of years, but you're always really impressed about that first-person perspective on – Here's what it feels like to be drafted in the NFL. Here's what it feels like to be a starter at this level in the, in the league. Here's what it feels like to win a Super Bowl. That's the kind of first-person perspective that very few people in life really have a chance to provide, but John Stinchcomb is one of the guys that do. So I find that to be really cool and really impressive, and I find that to be a, a lot of fun. Now, we're going to go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean here, but I want to take some time to talk to you about something here just for a moment. So... A lot of you know I just got back from Icon of the Seas, and I just want to tell you for a moment here how much fun all of this was. And I'm going to talk about something specific here just for a moment. Now, there is a reason for me why I love inviting people to go on Royal Caribbean cruise vacations, both Icon of the Seas that I was just on, our Dog Nation cruise coming up in April. There is a reason why this sort of means so much to me, and my time on Icon of the Seas, really very fortunate. I was invited by Royal Caribbean, got a chance to be one of the first to be on board this great cruise ship, the largest cruise ship ever constructed. But being on board Icon of the Seas kind of gave me a little bit of an idea about why I really enjoy recommending this so much to all of you. It's because, for whatever reason, a, a cruise ship like Icon of the Seas, a, a vacation like Royal Caribbean, gives you a chance to experience something that you would probably never try on your own. I'll tell you, for me, that was exactly true on Icon of the Seas. I'm sort of a man of leisure in many ways. You know, when I go on a, a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation, you know, I love, like, the Windjammer Cafe, and I love the specialty restaurants, Chops Grill and Giovanni's and, and all those things. You know, I, I love enjoying the great food. I, I love enjoying the bars and lounges and all the, the – they had a great rock band called Phoenix that was playing in Music Hall, and they're kind of doing some, you know, great 80s and, uh, you know – great sort of classic rock cover tunes so much fun that's the stuff that when i think of a royal caribbean cruise vacation that's the stuff that i sort of do all the time and you have a habit sometimes of just kind of wanting to keep doing the same thing over and over again that you're always doing but the royal caribbean cruise vacation really invites you to try something different that you've never done before now our good friend robin washington from royal caribbean was really encouraging me to try this thing called crown's edge it's really uh, the type of thing that I perhaps would not have tried, would not have done if I was not on a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. It's kind of like a skywalk, a ropes course, sort of a thrill ride, sort of all comp uh, combined into one thing. It's got some great theming around it. And I'll show you some of the video if you're watching here. Now, for some of you, this would not be as big a thrill as it was for me. So basically what I'm doing, if you're not watching on video, is you kind of walk across sort of like the, the the catwalk type thing. And then you get, and this is now, if you're watching me live on video, what you can't really quite tell is I'm suspended above the cruise ship, essentially looking out over the ocean. And you can see my uh, suit that I'm wearing there. Very, very windy, winds blowing. Now you get a chance to see me sort of sailing over the ocean, kind of flying. <laughs> I look pretty ridiculous probably, but I am having a great time. And that's the sort of thing, Crown's Edge, that I would not have done if not for a great Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. I appreciate Robin Washington for really encouraging me to do it. I appreciate the folks at Royal Caribbean who took good care of me while I did. And for some of you, you'll say, well, listen, you know, something else is I want, uh, you know, an even bigger thrill than that. Trust me, they got Category 6 water park. You can do all that if you want to. You can do pressure drop, the first open free fall water slide at sea you can do all that kind of stuff and eventually i might work my way up to that there as well but for me doing crown's edge on board icon of the seas was a kind of a first for me and i gotta tell you it was a really uh, a lot of fun and the sort of thing that listen that's what royal caribbean cruise vacations are all about doing something that perhaps you've never done before so big thanks to everybody on board icon of the seas for making that such a wonderful wonderful experience now 
Let me dive in here. Now, let me remind you also there as well. Jessica Slater, travel agent. We saw her on board. You can uh, reach out to her for your own trip on Icon of the Seas or to uh, be a part of our Dog Nation cruise coming in in April. Give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can also email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com. We are final days for our Dog Nation cruise. Final payments due here coming up in just a few days, I believe. So we've got to get on board, get excited about that. And if you've been on the fence, some of you I've heard from uh, Jessica and them, you've been talking, but you haven't quite pulled the trigger yet. It is time now to be on board. Icon of the Seas. We got a little bit of room left for you, but it's like down to the wire to get you going there on that. So reach out to Jessica Slater and she'll take care of you on all of that. Now, let's go cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And I want to start with where I just was with John a moment ago. And that's given some thoughts here about yesterday's AFC and NFC championship games. And it's interesting to see the Georgia tie. We just talked about the positive part of this, the Georgia players that will move on and have a chance to win a Super Bowl. I guess the negative tie into Georgia yesterday. A little bit of criticism coming Todd Munkin's way. Uh, I think a lot of folks sort of felt like Baltimore's game plan, a little too pass-heavy after a Chiefs defense that had really given up a lot of yards on the ground. Buffalo had had some success running the ball against uh, Kansas City, although not in a winning effort. Munkin kind of took some of the heat there on that yesterday. The honest truth is, is I don't really view Munkin as one of the top storylines for how the AFC title game played out. Going into the game, I thought any 50-50 call, Kansas City was going to probably get it for obvious reasons. Clearly, that worked out pretty much exactly as you would have expected that it would. And unfortunately for Lamar Jackson, who's a thrilling player, my son's favorite player, a lot of folks' favorite player, Lamar Jackson, I would say, is a very different player in the postseason than he is in the regular season. That was sort of proven true once again. And Kansas City, who has a history of winning, I think kind of leaned on its history to uh, to get that win there yesterday. I'd say the same thing about the NFC title game there as well. Dan Campbell and the Lions, that's probably a, probably a team I was kind of openly rooting for just because we haven't seen them have a whole lot of success. Uh, John Stinchcomb talked about the personal tie he had to Detroit a moment ago. But once again, you know, Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers, they've kind of been in these spots before. They've been in this uh, place before, and that seemed like they sort of leaned on that experience there too. A couple of teams – that had more history of winning with these current coaches, current players in the spot, seemed to lean on that history to get the win yesterday. You couldn't help but notice that. Uh, let's talk about the Texas Longhorns here for a moment because a little earlier in the show, I discussed the notion that perhaps it's time for Georgia to kind of redefine itself as you move into 2024 and kind of embrace some of the newness that the SEC is going to offer and the chance to kind of view some new rivals to the program, not meaning you necessarily have to say goodbye to any old rivalries, but you maybe have a chance to embrace some new rivalries. And one of the ones that I mentioned was Texas. Now, as Texas comes into the SEC, I do think it's going to be really interesting to see exactly how they fit into this league because, boy, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the Big 12 that just does not seem to make a lot of sense to me from an SEC, kind of like viewing it from an SEC lens. The whole issue with like the horns down thing, the fact that's so controversial in uh, in like Big 12 circles, you know, there was the Texas basketball coach of the day kind of pitching a fit about, you know, somebody saying it was the UCF players saying horns down in the, uh, in the handshake line after the game, by the way. If you're getting trash talked by UCF and you're bothered by it, that sort of tells you everything you need to know about, you know, what's not quite right with you when it comes to Texas, maybe. But there was the thing where I guess the BYU student section had the front row spelling out horns down a little bit like, say, like, you know, how the spike squad would do at Sanford Stadium or something like that had the horns down. They were asked to to, to get rid of that, get rid of the horns down, you know, T-shirts, whatever it was they were wearing. Uh, we don't quite know if that came at the behest of Texas or not. But the whole idea that this is such a big controversy in the Big 12 just gives you an idea that if Texas is not careful, they're going to get their feelings hurt in a big way in the SEC because you can't be that soft and thrive in this league. So it's going to be a little bit of a culture clash bringing that bunch into this league. It does create an opportunity for Georgia to kind of view a new rival. Texas has always been fairly easy to hate because there's a lot of pomposity there and a little bit of – I don't know, a um, sense of entitlement perhaps, and maybe some of the hysteria around horns down as an example of that. Uh, a couple other stories here real quick. So you've perhaps seen Kayshawn Butte, the former LSU wide receiver now with the New England Patriots, is in some real hot water, got arrested on some gambling stuff here. So if I have the facts right, it's this. So over the course of his time being in LSU, and uh, talking about 
a, a guy who, according to NOLA.com, bet on 9,000 different sporting events, a total of like more than $600,000 worth of wagers on all of this, and he was doing this as a minor. I guess the big headline here is is that six of the games, at least six of the games that he bet on, were games involving LSU, and a couple of those were involving his own performance. You can do the player props, you know, the over-under on receiving yards, things like that, uh, you know, scoring an anytime touchdown, something along those lines. And Butte also bet on himself there and kind of did that as part of parlays and things like that. So this is a really big deal. And I would say that for Butte, his football career is very much in jeopardy just on the, you know, the fact that they're going to treat this as a pretty serious crime because he had to falsify, you know, stuff to to bet when he was younger than 21. So that's kind of an issue there. But also the fact that he was betting in his own game, that's going to be a big time violation of NCAA rules and things like that. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I really don't know what you're going to do about this. The comparison I would make is, do you remember if you're like me and you were going to concerts in like, say, late 90s, early 2000s, you had the printed ticket from Ticketmaster. Did you ever have these? And on the like the printed ticket when you would go to a concert, like one of the things that was like usually printed like right there on the ticket was, hey, no cameras, no recording devices. That was... That was just the biggest no-no in the world. You could not bring a recording device into a concert. But eventually, once everybody got the you know the smartphones, well, now everybody's got a recording device. And so all of a sudden now, you may want to be hard and fast rules against something like that being recorded, but the prevalence of everyone having this, everyone having access to a recording device, made that impossible to enforce. And part of me kind of wonders the same thing on the gambling front. You can treat player gambling on himself as the biggest no-no in the world. And to a certain extent, perhaps you possibly should. But just giving the ready access that exists for players in gambling, does this become a little bit like recording devices at a concert? That you may want this to be illegal or you may want this to be viewed as improper, but the sheer prevalence of it makes it impossible to enforce that. I kind of wonder. I also think the idea of players and their supposed inside information is probably a little bit overrated. I think if you'll notice, not everybody cares about gambling. I totally understand that. But if you'll notice the way that gambling gets covered in the sports news, almost every big sports site, sports entity, has some sort of connection to a sports book, you know, the the, the odds makers. Almost every big sports media entity has some connection to some sort of sports book. So therefore, all of the sports gambling news is sort of covered from a very sports book-centric perspective. In other words, here is how the average gambler is trying to defraud the sports book. That's sort of the vantage point that all of this gets covered from. I think there needs to be a lot more scrutiny in what the books are doing to the gamblers than what the gamblers are trying to do to the books, including the, uh, I guess, the athletes involved here there as well. So I feel like this is a story that's going to get a lot of attention because of the sheer magnitude of what Butte was doing. And clearly he's violated laws and rules. But moving forward, I don't know how easy any of this is going to be to enforce. And if you can't enforce it, then the question becomes, well, then what do you do about it? I'll give you one final story here there as well. So I saw where Jalen Milrow was asked about, you know, Kalen DeBoer, how you feel about DeBoer and all this. And, you know, the statement he gave was very kind of sort of matter of fact. Hey, you know, boy, he's a real personal guy, you know, really seemed to be getting along. This is very sort of generic. It wasn't bad. It wasn't overly good. It was just positive and warm, just, you know, sort of a pleasant statement. And I think for me, the nature of the statement, relatively short, not anything wrong with it, but still nonetheless, kind of a straight matter of fact statement, I think speaks to what I do believe is going to become one of the interesting stories of this upcoming year. Kalen DeBoer sort of already showed you that Julian Sayan, not his guy. He wanted Austin Mack instead. Uh, Julian Sayan has now moved on. He's at Ohio State, part of the big spending spree the Buckeyes have allegedly uh, been on here. Is Jalen Milrow... Kalen DeBoer's guy seems like the answer should be obvious. Milrow right now is one of the shortest favorites to win this year's Heisman Trophy. But we also saw, De, you know, Milrow at times not exactly thrive. He was benched for the USF game. Uh, we know how important quarterback play has been to DeBoer and Ryan Grubb, the brand-new offensive coordinator. I think one of the interesting stories to look at right now, everybody's saying the right thing. Right now, perhaps everyone's even doing the right thing. But moving forward, is Milrow – going to be Kalen DeBoer's guy. I think that's a little bit more of an open issue than some people probably realize. We'll make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And as we wrap up things here today, we will do so with a golden shoe. Now, speaking of 
former uh, Georgia and SEC ties to the uh, conference championship games. So uh, all, Doug Aldridge sends this to me. He says, this clown's been acting this way since college. And it's uh, Chauncey Gardner. <laughs> uh, freezing cold takes got this. Gardner apparently playing for the Lions when Detroit had a 20-7 to lead. Now, this is uh, Gardner on the sideline there. He's waving goodbye to the 49ers fans, essentially calling ball game there in San Francisco yesterday. We know they didn't quite work out that way. And I must agree with Doug here on this. Gardner, unfortunately, does have a little bit of a history of this kind of thing. A little bit too much celebrating, a little bit too much trash talk that was almost never backed up. I would say, unfortunately, for uh, Mr. Gardner, that's probably true. Freezing cold takes captured it. Doug shared it with me, so we'll give a golden shoe there for that. By the way, speaking of the lousy, stinking Gators, how about a Gator hater updater for you here there as well? It's now been 1,178 days since those lousy, stinking Gators have beaten Georgia. Georgia may embrace some new rivalries, but this is still the rivalry that matters more than any other. We love watching that number going up and up and up. And we'll see all of you back here again tomorrow for Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They show up on time. Uh, they do the work that's promised, the price is promised. You can trust them on all of that. So uh, good to have you back. Great to be doing the R.S. Andrews Cooldown with you again. Uh, fun to be speaking to you here from a new studio We've still got some more kind of like decorating I want to do in here. Just being gone last week, didn't get a chance to do quite as much as I perhaps would have liked to have done, but I think it looks really good. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, Rambo at dognation.com earlier said, oh, man, that's a great-looking virtual set. Now, there's no virtual set. I could take an ax right now. I could literally chop through this wall. This is a, a, a real set, which is, listen, I was very thankful for the set we had on our previous studio but I'm a little bit more of the real thing. I'm a little bit authentic. Uh, so there you look at the. How about that? Close up of the original golden shoe. So this is the phenomenon that started it all. Uh, nice look there. Uh, by the way, uh, condolences. I'll be sending the passing of Uga Ten. A little bobblehead paying homage to him. A uh, football that I stole from my son's room. Uh, a mug that my grandfather made me. Um, uh, the uh, just some really nice stuff there on with all of that. So uh, great to see. All right, we're gonna get to your comments here. I'm gonna start on YouTube, and then we'll kind of bounce around after that. And uh, we're just glad to have you here. Um, let's see what else. Christy says everything is fuzzy. Is that a Paul Moon says prove it? <laughs> I'm not gonna chop. I'm not gonna chop through it right now. Uh, let's see what else. Um, Frank Patterson says, you must address Texas making fun of Q's passing, looking more forward to that game instead of the uh, the Shriners game. Yeah, so, I, so let me make sure I get the facts right on this because I think Frankie did share this with me. So it was the Texas Barstool account, is that who did this? Something along the lines of, uh, you know, Q being maliciously attacked and sucker punched by Bevo at the Sugar Bowl a couple of years ago, a, fran uh, a program acting like it had not been a major game and, you know, decades certainly that day is that what that was is is that the nature of that because i did not quite see that by the time i kind of got in on that uh um uh christy says that she's not drunk by the way which is always a nice thing to uh confirm at 11 something in the morning here in the east um, in the eastern time zone which is very funny but is that kind of what happened the barstool account kind of said that yeah it's pretty classless pretty classless um uh, let's Thomas Tebow also says, so, Brandon, I guess we do not uh, count Florida basketball beating uh, Georgia basketball. No, we were certainly disappointed about that. Obviously, the comeback effort for Georgia fell a little bit short. Thrilled about the win against LSU, by the way, but coming up a little bit short against uh, Florida. But in terms of the countdown, uh, it is football that we count there on that. Spencer Clark also pointing out something else I'm a little late on. Congratulations to Terrence Edwards. Uh, Brand new head coaching job. Uh, we can't wait to uh, celebrate that with Terrence at Mount Vernon. As I said before, you know, you come back home, you're trying to catch up on the news, things like that. Saw Terrence got the head coaching job. Thrilled about that for him. Really uh, excited. Really excited. Um, Frank Patterson says that Portnoy did fire the Texas Barstool guy that did that. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting spot for Barstool to kind of find itself in because – and I – like the so the accounts all exist for the various schools, right? And I'm guessing a lot of those accounts have probably been passed down a good number of times now, right? I mean, like for all we know, the UGA barstool accounts like a different person every year. I mean, it may even be like several different people. 
Uh, and so when you've got that many accounts, because pretty much every school's got one, right? So you're talking about, you know, a couple of hundred barstool college accounts probably, right? So every – think about, like, the – Think about the li- potential liability you have around your name, even loosely so, being connected to all these various accounts. You're almost surprised stuff like that didn't happen more than it does. Um, uh, Jonathan Aaron wants more cruise giveaways. <laughs> Listen, I- I'd give you all a spot if I could, Jonathan. I'd give you all a spot if I could. Uh, Christy also mentioned the fact that uh, Dave Portnoy did win a million-dollar bet on his Michigan Wolverines. I believe I have the facts right on this, beating Alabama. I believe I do have the facts right on that. And, Christy, I believe you're correct there as well. Paul Moon says, uh, happy for Terrence Edwards. Was kind of hoping he'd come uh, over to you. Hey, listen, you know, I I think that door may be one day still open for Terrence to be a coach in college. I'd certainly love for him to do that. But, you know, his brother Robert's been a very good high school head coach for quite some time. And in Georgia, being a high school football head coach is really pretty good life. So, uh you know, Terrence gets to take that next step as a head coach here. I'm thrilled there on that. Um, let's see what else. Frank Patterson said it was sad to see B.A. in those Oregon colors on the ship. He's talking about the, uh, you know, you have to wear like the, it's, it's kind of like a flight suit. I don't really know what the what the real thing is called. But uh, you have to kind of wear that. And listen, that wind was flopping back and forth. And some of y'all are like really adventurous. I'm not typically as it like i love theme parks but in a theme park situation you're strapped in there's really very little room for user error like when i'm walking up here like this i mean i could slip now if i slip i'm still harnessed in but i, I just don't trust like you can see i'm walking very gingerly uh very gingerly because i'm just I'm, I'm nervous like i'm really worried about this but as I said before you know uh, our friend Robin from Royal Caribbean, she really encouraged me to do it. Now, when you get out to the edge here, like when you stand there on the edge, it just drops psh, and you just go flying. And, you know, you're flying out there across the ocean. I mean, look at that. Uh, I mean, I don't look like the smoothest, you know, cat when I'm, you know, doing all this right here. By the way, I'm not as fat as that suit makes me look either. Let me just also confirm that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm nowhere near that. And I am fatter now than I was a couple of months ago, unfortunately, but I am nowhere near that fat. So let me just confirm that. But, um, yeah, uh, so fun times, fun times. Um, let's see what else. Paul Moon also reminds the camera puts on 10 pounds. Boy, I'm used to that. By the way, speaking of that, uh, <laughs> so I said this to some of our audience a little earlier. The cameras are also in a different spot here in the studio, so I'm always kind of tempted to sort of look where the cameras used to be and just kind of stare at the wall because that's where I'm sort of used to looking and not because I can barely see the cameras. kind of dark in here, so I can barely see the cameras as it is. And the other thing about these cameras is they're positioned high, which means they're shooting down on me. And the one thing y'all know, and listen, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't hide this. I am as God made me. Um, I got a decent amount of hair, like, right here. But if you kind of get back here to the southern hemisphere a little bit, uh, there's not quite as much hair going on. And these camera angles are shot at a dangerous uh, angle for me where I, you know, kind of creep a little forward too much. And, boy, I'm showing the audience something I do not want them to be able to see. So there you go. Um let me pop over to uh, do some Facebook stuff here for a moment, too. There you go. Boy, look at that. So that's my grandfather's mug. The mug right there in the middle. I appreciate all the close-ups of this. So the mug right there in my middle, in the middle there, my grandfather made that. And so, like, he really is the reason why I'm a Georgia fan. You know, took me to games uh, when I was very uh, young uh, as a very small child. And when he passed away, that was one of the great things from him I was able to get. So that was a part of our you know, old studio in a previous life and being able to bring that in here. And then you kind of got the uh, Harry dog kind of 1990s era there, kind of a cool throwback bobblehead. And then that uh, dog standing on the G there, it's a little bit weathered. Like that's probably one of the oldest Georgia things I have too. Like that was for sort of my personal thing. So I'm happy to have all the uh, Georgia stuff, you know, back in here again. And as time goes on, we're going to add some more stuff to this, hang some stuff on the walls, things like that. We're just sort of now in the process of making that uh, look like our home. So very, very happy to have the uh, brand new spot here. Really excited about all of that. Uh, William Camacho says that he's afraid of heights too. Yeah, so like being afraid of heights is something I didn't really used to be. And as I said before, I still ride theme park rides. Like my my family, we always go to theme parks. We love that. Um, I still ride most of the theme parks. Now, not like the craziest rides, like, you know, 
some of the stuff you see, like the very craziest rides, I probably don't have quite the courage to do. But a lot of the theme park rides, I'm happy to ride. But there was a time a few years ago, and it was, I don't know why, it was sort of connected to my kids being born or somehow like that. I just one day, boom, a switch got flipped, and I became a lot more afraid of heights than I'd ever been before. I think what it is is if you're ever standing in a high area, like a hotel balcony or something like that, my kids are just so fidgety. They're just like, you know, bouncing and shaking all the time that I'm just always afraid they're just going to sort of bounce right off the rail or something like that. So I think that kind of thing has made me a little bit uh, more, uh, you know, averse of heights than I used to be. Uh, Jerry Poppin says, I suppose it's my envy fangs showing, but I think I would look better on that uh, than B.A. did doing that on the Royal Caribbean ship. Well, listen, Jerry, they'd love to have you. I know that. And it is a really fun and exciting thing. And, you know, I, listen, I try not to do this from the standpoint of, oh, I got to do something that was fun. I was very proud to be able to be there. I was very thankful that Royal Caribbean invited me to be a part of it. But I also will say that being there and seeing all of it, it really did just confirm for me all the time over the course of the last few months that I had spent talking about it, it was all time well spent, that it really is a fun and exciting new uh, chapter. It really is. And if you've been on a cruise vacation before, I think you'll find Icon of the Seas to be unlike anything you've ever experienced. And when it comes to all the new things that Royal Caribbean has in 2024, including uh, an Oasis-class ship for our Dog Nation cruise coming up in April, uh, I truly do believe that this is a great time to take your first Royal Caribbean cruise vacation as well because you can do some things you've never done before. You can try some things that you otherwise wouldn't get to try. You can have that experience. That's really what it's all about. So, uh, yeah, Jerry, I hope you get a chance to do that. Um, Randy Hall, no, I, no, that's not quite no, that's not quite the case. Um, uh, let's see what else. Lucy Bowers Boykin says she calls that being older and wiser. Maybe that is the case. Um, uh, Jamie Huff says, so we're just going to ignore the fact that Munkin's uh, – Game plan against a poor run defense was only called 18 run play. Six combined carries the running backs, no boots, no moving the pocket. So, Jamie, admittedly, like I'm not an expert on, you know, the play calling tendencies of the Baltimore Ravens. But here's what I can tell you is that, you know, there has been some chatter by Ravens fans online of, you know, going back to like sort of, I guess it would have been Greg Roman, right? Greg Roman is offensive coordinator. Too many runs, you know, too conservative. You know, Baltimore is a program, not program, organization. Baltimore is an organization that's sort of, for whatever reason, always had a hard time activating the wide receivers. I would say, and listen, I don't feel that passionately about this. I don't feel that strongly about this, but it is my opinion nonetheless. Todd Munkin was not brought to Baltimore to run the football. And you can say, well, Kansas City has a bad rush defense. I do get that, and it's very easy to money morning quarterback that after the fact. And for all I know, you may be right about it. I really do. But – Munkin was brought to Baltimore, I believe, to upgrade the passing attack. That's what Munkin's you know, M.O. had been, especially predating his time at Georgia. Munkin was thought to be a very pass-happy offensive coordinator. That's just what he was kind of you know, thought to be. So I put the game yesterday on, on Jackson probably more so than on Munkin. I do. Um, I don't know that we've seen – regular season Lamar in a playoff game yet. I, I, I don't know that we have. And Lamar Jackson is a thrilling player. But part of the reason why I didn't get too up in arms about you know the Falcons not bringing him in is because while he clearly would have made the Falcons more interesting and more exciting, this is not really a guy that's kind of shown you that in the playoffs yet. And that's kind of what I put the game on yesterday. In a battle between two quarterbacks, one who always seems to win the playoff, the other who seems to you know, never quite win in the playoffs, at least against the best competition that he faced, that narrative prevailed once again. Now, the other thing is, is that I don't think it took a genius to understand that any 50-50 call in this game was going to go to the Chiefs, and it did. Pass interference things, things like that. Clearly, the, the sort of 50-50 calls all went the Chiefs' way. I think you could have assumed that would have been true, and I believe you would have been right for assuming so. Uh, that's also, I think, part of that story there as well. Let us see what else. Mike Mazzell says Dan Campbell lost that game last night. Yeah, so as uh, you know, John mentioned, you know, Campbell's been praised all year long for aggressive decisions, willingness to go for it on fourth, go for two. And last night, perhaps in retrospect, a little too aggressive. Maybe that's the case. Um, 
Uh, Glenn uh, Edmonds, so apparently I'm not the only one who felt this way. He says uh, under 40, you'll jump off a road, but anybody who gets over 40, um, uh, even jumping off a truck tailgate starts getting a little scary. Yeah, I think part of that too is is that injury recoveries after you're 40, and for those of you who aren't 40 yet, just, just know you have this to look forward to, injury recoveries just take a little longer these days. And so I am a lot more like, I don't want even like a nick and bruise type of injury anymore because it just takes a little longer to get used to, uh, or not used to. It takes a little longer to get over. You know, the the injury recovery stuff just lasts. You know, just a little bit, a little bit tougher than it used to be. So uh, uh, from that standpoint, that may have a little something to do with that there as well. But just that feeling of being really high up is just a little bit different. And also. This is one of those things where, like, the video doesn't do it justice because the video is being shot from the vantage point of the cruise deck. But when you're up there on the, you know, skywalk type thing, you are not looking down at the cruise deck. You're looking down, you know, 200 feet to the ocean below. That's the thing. You understand. Look at that. You talk about that's like the Jordan Jumpman logo. I mean, that. I mean, you're talking about grace. That is grace right there. I mean, that, I mean, seriously, that could be my own version of the, of the Jordan Jumpman logo right there. Fat guy holding on for dear life. Like that, because like the one thing I could not train my brain to understand is, is that the harness was holding me up. I'm squeezing those robes as if my life depends on, you know, my hands holding on to that. <laughs> Listen, you know, uh, it, it was a good time. That's all I'm going to say. It was a good time. Marshall Fleming says age is just a number if you stay in shape your whole life. So there you go. Although I will say that, like, and listen, there are a lot of y'all who are in a lot better shape than me, but if you get hurt, you're still going to have a wild, you know, it's not like you're going to have superhuman injury recovery. Uh, you can be in great shape, and it's good to be in, I do believe being in good shape is a good thing to be as long as you can because I do think it keeps you, you know, doing what you want to do, uh, whether even it's just like sort of playing golf, playing tennis, something like that. But even if you're, you know, you're rocked out in your 50s, Injury recovery is still going to last. It's still going to take you a little while. That's just a fact. Um, let's see what else. Uh, somebody apparently trolling on here on Facebook here for a moment. Bill Sanders checking out. Bill, we're glad that you're here today. Uh, look at Eddie. Talk about Eddie's new look here. Boy, nice to see all this showing off. So, so Eddie's got like a, a illuminated, is that the word I'm looking for here? An illuminated uh, gator hater sign. Uh, Dog Nation branding. Our friends at the Dog Cave made this for Eddie. Uh, how great is that? By the way, a little logo placement for the Dog Cave on here there as well. So they're loving life on that. Uh, but, yeah, Eddie's got a fresh new look here, uh, a little glow up. Um, and th- so this is the Dog Nation daily logo uh, thing that our uh, buddy UGA Nation 412 made for us. Um, just gorgeous, absolutely beautiful woodworking, uh, wonderful there. Uh, Dr. Pepper. So I'm going to get in trouble for putting this on because uh, – but uh, Dr. Pepper here from the from the national championship game. So this was actually the cans of Dr. Pepper they had out in L.A. Uh, really good stuff. Uh, I brought one of these back on the plane with me. I was just so afraid it was going to blow up in the plane and just spew Dr. Pepper everywhere, which would have been a sad loss of Dr. Pepper, but also, you know, a total waste of time to bring it back if it ended up the pecan getting ended up getting punctured. But that's that from the uh, national championship game in L.A. Obviously, the Coke bottle from 2021. Uh, panning up there, you see, uh, uh, how about Ugga 6? The Ugga 6 bobblehead. So the glass, hard to see the glass, but that was given to me by the uh, Bulldog Club of Jacksonville after the 2021 national championship. It's got the uh, Gator Hater logo on the inside of that. Of course, one of the books that I was featured in after Georgia's second national championship. Um Nice little standing dog there and some stuff I've collected over the years. So uh, really good stuff and fun to kind of be showing some of that off with you here today. Uh, <laughs> Philip Jordan Wells says we look like the Home Shopping Network right now, which is funny. Um, let's see what else. Roger Hall and BMAC kind of talking about some of the ways in which kind of slipped away from Georgia here this year. And unfortunately, a lot of that is uh, quite true, unfortunately. Um, let's see what else. Doggy says, I believe going back to Caleb Downs, how does a player lose? How does a program lose out on a player that we never even had? We don't even know if our NIL entity placed a bid. UGA didn't quote lose anything. Uh, I would say that's probably a fair assessment. Now, we do know that Georgia was certainly recruiting Downs because there have been plenty of reports about, you know, and 
just even people who know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody will tell you that Downs was in Athens at uh, one point two weeks ago. So, I mean, there was clearly a recruitment going on. But in terms of whatever the NIL offer was, we don't quite know that. Um, uh, <laughs> TT. <laughs> I shouldn't uh, uh, make light because that's obviously a very serious thing. But boy, that that brings the uh, fun to a screeching halt. Unfortunately, on that front, uh, let's see what else. Um, Dogs on top says, uh, "Who from the coastal elite did you get to meet on the cruise?" What's funny you should ask. So we were on board the same time as the naming ceremony was taking place, and sure enough, now I didn't get to see him. But on the ship for the naming ceremony was Lionel Messi. So uh, Royal Caribbean sponsors enter, sponsors enter Miami, and uh, is that the name of the team? Uh, and so Messi was on the ship for the, the ship sailed out of Miami. So Messi came onto the ship and participated in the naming ceremony. I did see, uh, y'all know who Mario Lopez is uh, from Saved by the Bell fame? Uh, Lopez was also one of the celebrities, uh, you know, on board the ship. And as we walked on for the very first time, like Mario Lopez was just standing right there. And so uh, saw him, uh, obviously, uh, Slater from Saved by the Bell. And he's done a million things since then, but I'll always think of him from Saved by the Bell. So saw Mario Lopez on the ship. And uh, Messi was on the ship, but I did not get to see him. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Joe Garliardi also said that at one point in time, he wasn't afraid of heights at all. But having kids just changed something. I was walking on a bridge over the Tennessee River. My kids were trying to squeeze through the railings uh, because I was in the uh, middle and still. Yeah, I'm just telling you right now, like, uh, that's the kind of thing. Uh, we were at one of these fairs one time. I think it was like the coming fair. Um, and that's my daughter. She's much younger. Like, we're riding like the little, uh, uh, like the sky lift type thing, you know, like the little chair. It's like a chair lift type deal you sit in. And she would not be still. And, I mean, I was panicked. Panic. She's just moving around. I thought she was going to shake us both out for at one point in time. But I'm like holding on to her dear life. Her eyes are popping out. And I'm squeezing her so hard just because I, I mean, and she wasn't to her, you know, credit wasn't really moving around that much. But it just seemed like she's just, I don't know, just moving around. The whole thing was just kind of freaks you out a little bit. Randy Hall says, B.A., Messi, and Lopez, a trio of celebrities. Uh, celebrities. I guess that's the case. DT says, I've got four Royal Caribbean cruise vacations in my contract per year. I don't know if we'll quite get to four here this year. Now, I will confess, I do have some time coming up in February. They're going to have to take off, but that's not a cruise. We're just going to be off from work for a few days there. Um, my kids are going to be out of school, so we're going to do a little bit of time away from work for them there on that. Um, but that will not – I wish it was a cruise, but it's not. Um Ken Holcomb says Ohio State may outspend us, but they will never outcoach or outplay us. It takes the it factor, and they don't have it. Kirby has the ability to instill it into his players. Kent, I would agree with you on that. I believe you're very much true there on that. Let's go back around the comments again, back to YouTube here for a moment. Um, Paul Moon mentioning that the latest version of McColl in Kansas City a little quieter than the first time around. I would say that's probably true, at least the best I can tell. Oh, Frank Patterson brings up a good point. The scarf from 2021. I got to figure out what that is. I wore the, do y'all remember that after the national championship? I wore that scarf like every day for months. Um, we got we, we to find a home for that in here. That's a really good point, Frank. Uh, very good point. Oh, we got to find a way to do that. I like that. I like that. Uh, oh, Jonathan Aaron says, this is nice to know. He says the lighting, and we are using a little bit of a redder tint in here. Maybe that's helping. And we also have, I'm told, soft like we have like this little bit of a softer light apparently my hair according to uh reports does not look nearly as gray that's exciting so i look more bald but less gray interesting interesting now my grandfather used to always say when it came to your hair he would rather it turn gray than turn loose so i don't know where that leads me in all of all of this but uh being told that the lighting a little softer i'm kind of like the uh sort of um you know, like sort of the aging newscaster, you know, that you put the Vaseline on the screen, you start shooting it from farther and farther away. <laughs> sort of like the Barbara Walters thing, you know, you start getting farther and farther away. I sort of feel like that's kind of the stage of my career that I'm in. <laughs> is that the close-ups aren't doing me any favors. So, uh, yeah, there you go there on that. Um, let's see what else. Oh, Christy. 
here, Christy had talked, stabbed me in the heart. Uh, here I am, got somebody talking about I don't have less gray hair, and then Christy just comes in for the kill shot saying that my forehead is shiny. That is probably true. I have a very big head. Uh, like I, when it comes to like hats and things like that, I can't really buy off the rack. I have gigantic head, and I also don't wear makeup. You know, if I wore makeup, you wouldn't be able to see the the, the shine there. But I figure, I don't know. We're talking sports. Do I really want to you know get caked up to come do the show every day? I'm not quite so sure. But here I am thinking, you know, Christy and I, we, had, we thought we have something, and she just pow, uh, right there. Uh, Bubby Dean says, Christy off the top rope. Yeah, she, that is indeed true. Christy says, need some power. I really do. Like a little bit of powder. So, um, you know, when you do like a regular TV thing, you know, you do put makeup on. And I used to do this very early morning thing on Channel 11. Uh, it'd be like 5.30 in the morning, 6 of the latest, doing a hit for their morning show. And they got the full-on like makeup chair and everything. Um, and so... I mean, it's early. Like, I mean, it's it's the time of morning when everybody is still asleep. And I'm sitting there in the chair and you get all that, you know, stuff on. And I used to also, like, when I first started doing a little bit of TV, I tried to do makeup myself because I was so worried about, you know, appearance, things like that. You sort of grow out of that eventually. But um, I used to always put too much. It'd just be like, I mean, just, just too much. Yeah, Christy, I appreciate that. Uh all in good, all in good fun, Christy. All in good fun. Uh, Brandon Griffin likes the new set. Uh, good to hear that. Uh, appreciate that. Um, uh, Nature gave him the subject of the Zach Robinson is the new Falcons offensive coordinator. I like this hire. Um, I think the Raheem Morris thing is really pretty interesting because Atlanta obviously had Morris. As an interim coach, you would feel like if anybody knew Morris, Atlanta did, did not want to hire him the first time. Now they want to hire him here right now. Certainly everything you hear coming from league circles and nothing Atlanta loves more than be lauded in league circles. Um, but uh, uh, but everything you hear coming from within league circles will tell you that Morris is absolutely a coach deserving of a second chance as being a full-time head coach after the stint in Tampa Bay did not go very well. I'm sort of ambivalent to it. I didn't really want uh, Belichick. I think the problem from a PR standpoint um, from the Falcons is, A, there are a lot of people that just don't want to give them the benefit of the doubt about anything. Maybe I'm one of those people, but that's that's part of the problem. And the second thing is, is that Atlanta had a set up to believe that it was going to be Bill Belichick. And, in fact, a lot of media types, now maybe the Falcons say, well, listen, we can't be responsible for everything the media reports. To a certain extent, that's probably true. But a lot of these media types were like basically treating it as if it was only Belichick, who was kind of the only guy for the Falcons' job. And by the way, Atlanta could have leaked something on that. If they wanted to throw water on that, they chose not to. So the point is, is I do believe, even though I guess I'm probably a little bit happier to have Raheem Morris than I would have been to have Bill Belichick. I don't think that Belichick at this point in his career is deserving of giving – Atlanta giving him what he wanted. I don't believe he is. But when you talk about the most substantial resume in the history of NFL coaches, and that's what you're kind of setting as the expectation, and by comparison, it's a much more meager resume from Morris, I do not believe that Atlanta did itself any favors from a PR standpoint. But that doesn't mean that Morris isn't a better coach. In fact, he's probably my preference over Belichick, to be honest. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, MG says that Mahomes won yesterday because of defense. It's football. Tom Brady's wide receivers have the lowest, yard, the lowest yards after catch of any quarterback who ever won a Super Bowl in NFL history, which means he was doing more with way less. Uh, I mean, I do believe that, you know, it's kind of funny, Steve Spagnola, you know, former head coach, the guy's in his 60s now. You know, I do believe he was one of the real stars uh, of the game yesterday and one of the real stars in the league this season. Mike McDonald, the Georgia grad, on the other side for Baltimore, you know, we pay a lot of attention to a Mahomes and a Jackson coming into games like this. But really, uh, you know, it's it's the two defensive coordinators that probably played as much a role in the success that those two teams had as any. And, and in the case of Baltimore, not everybody cares about the advanced stat stuff, but if you follow like DVOA, which was invented by uh, the guy from Football Outsiders, Football Outsiders doesn't even exist anymore. But um, uh, the guy that created the formula called DVOA, I believe the Ravens were the fifth-best team of all time, according to this particular formula, at least 
best team going back to like say 1981 or something like that and a lot of the blowout wins they got were part of the reason why they rated so high statistically and some of those blowout wins occurred because of just how good uh um you know just how good defensively Mike McDonald's group was so both coordinators in the AFC title game probably were underappreciated in terms of the impact they had on the overall success and Spagnolo throwing those blitzes and things like that I mean listen I'm not drawing this stuff up on the chalkboard I don't know what they were doing but uh you know those blitzes and things like that they were throwing at Lamar Jackson yesterday you know clearly had him flummoxed all day long that's true um oh Frank Patterson also pointing out that uh uh while I was doing the uh, crown's edge on icon of the seas nick saban was doing the uh the like the we call that wakeboarding is that what you call that or or what do you what do you call that uh yeah wakeboard kind of on the wakeboard trying to uh, ride the waves i would say i was better at the crown's edge than nick saban was on the wakeboard maybe we'll do a little side-by-side comparison on that i feel like i was better at that than saban was uh it's a really good point um christy says the chiefs in the nfl got a bump in viewers yeah i would say that a, she's right about that. And B, you know, typically speaking, the NFL is so popular that it almost doesn't matter who's playing in the game. They're going to get gigantic ratings no matter what because the NFL is just that popular. But obviously Kansas City, because of the Taylor Swift thing, I would say takes it to an entirely different level. Now, can I give you all a hot take slash prediction that you did not ask for? This is totally ludicrous. This is completely outside the bounds of what we typically talk about on this show. But I want to be on the record. Today is Monday, starting the first of two weeks of buildup for the Super Bowl. Here's my prediction. You can roll your eyes. You can hate me for saying this, but I want some posted odds on this. My prediction is that sometime between now and the next two weeks, there will be growing rumors about a possible Kelsey Taylor Swift breakup. That's my prediction that at some point in time over the course of the next two weeks, growing suspicion of unhappiness between the couple. And I believe it will lead to open suspicion about whether or not Taylor Swift will even be at the Super Bowl. And I believe eventually we will see some yes, no odds posted on whether or not Swift is actually shown during the TV broadcast being at the game. I'm not saying this is – Obviously, overwhelmingly likely to happen. I'm saying this is a little bit of a long shot play that I'd be interested in. Watch for the possible rumor of a possible breakup between Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. And when that happens, if it does, remember I told you first. Um, Let's see what else. Uh, Richard D says, so we have some real bricks in the wall now. Yeah, these are real legitimate bricks now. And See, a lot of y'all don't really remember, but this is kind of what our old studio used to look like, at least a version of that. And we essentially just sort of brought that kind of look back. For whatever reason, I always like, like, I am not a very fancy person. I am just sort of like regular meat and potatoes type guy. Like, there's another studio like right down the road from where we are here. Not right down the road, but like right down the hall. Oh, my gosh, it's so big. I mean, this is a wonderful state-of-the-art studio as well. But like this other studio is so big and so fancy. It's probably almost too fancy for me. I, I probably – like I'm just a little bit more of like – like I'm just sort of a blue-collar guy doing sort of a workman's job. You know what I'm saying? So like I want a studio that sort of reflects that. I don't want anything too – now when it comes to like sponsor things, things like that, you've got to kind of – you know, give them a little bit of shininess and a little bit of, you know, whatever. But when it comes to my own sort of commitment to talking to all of you, listen, I'm just we're just I'm just a regular guy. So I want a studio that sort of has sort of a regular look to it. And that's what it's kind of, you know, kind of all about here. So, um, yeah, so that's what we kind of have going on here right now. Uh, pretty good stuff. Uh, Scott Harris says leave that stuff to TMZ. I won't bring it up again, but if it happens, Scott, I want to get credit for having called it first. That's uh, I won't mention it again, but if it happens, I'd post the odds about 100 to 1, maybe 250 to 1 on that. But if it happens, I want some credit. Um, let's see what else. <laughs> Barack Dog uh, <laughs> says uh, uh, Scott Harris has got him LOLing right now. Um DT says that B.A. is a man of the people. Indeed, I am. Uh, Caleb Meyer says that Ryan Day is spending big. Blackbeard's coming for his treasure. Yeah, that's probably about right. That's probably about right. Um, 
I think it'll be funny. Y'all ever see the photo of like David Letterman? I think I referenced it the day when Letterman retired and had just let the beard grow out. Like, you know, he just sort of, he didn't, he was completely unrecognizable. Like, what if Ryan Day gets fired after the end of this year and he just sort of lets himself go for a while? You know, sometimes people have a little bit of a, you know, kind of a whatever, uh, you know, Day just sort of lets himself go and all of a sudden the beard dies, just gone. It's just like gray. And, like, just everything just goes gray. He just sort of gives up the charade. I think that would be great. Um, let's see what else. Randy Hall says to put on your Gilligan's Island skipper's hat. So for our – for our, uh, we do a lot of events on water, as it turns out. But for our uh, uh, Dog Nation invasion of the Tennessee River, our good friend um, uh, Faraday, who works with us, bought those, like, like you said, kind of like those cruise ship captain hats. I was going to wear one for a video, but as I told you before, you know, my head is roughly the size of, like, one of Jupiter's moons. And Connor wouldn't let me wear the hat because it was so small on my head. Uh, he said that it – I said, does this look good ridiculous or bad ridiculous? And he said it looked bad ridiculous, just way too small. So so the kind of – once again, like, I have a hard time buying headgear off the rack. And so I was going to wear, like, the sort of cruise hat type thing, but it just wouldn't fit on my head. Uh, let's see what else. Rambo says that Letterman post retirement look an oversized Ewok, which is very funny. All right, a couple of more uh, comments. We're gonna get out of here. Back on Facebook. Um, let's see what else is going on here. See the, over here on Facebook, they're talking about uh, Taylor Swift. Um, let's see what else. Lucy Bowers boy can thank you for the kind words. That's very funny. Um, uh, Miriam Corbin enjoying her, herself, getting ready to get out of here. Johnny Prescott says the Chiefs' late season swoon has all the feels of the Lakers sleepwalking through an NBA season and blowing through the playoffs to a championship. It's a really interesting comparison because, I mean, listen, y'all know I am not watching every snap of NFL football. I'm just not. I just I, – I, I'm, on Sundays, I'm exhausted. Now, I don't say that in a bad way. I love my life and I love my job. But on Sundays, I'm tired. So, you know, I'm usually trying to get in front of the red zone around 3 p.m. or something like that, watch a little witching hour, you know, try to watch a little bit of the primetime game. But I am not one of these guys that's watching 10 hours of football. Uh, what is it? Scott Hansen says 10 hours of commercial-free football. That's more NFL than I want, just to be totally honest with you. So, you know, I, I can't tell you every single thing about every one of these teams – but I do know that what the commenter said is really true, is that uh, you know Kansas City has had its uh, issues here this year. And um, they seem to be one of those teams that seems to be able to figure it out at the, in time of the playoffs, a little bit like an NBA team has done. And so you kind of wonder, well, I mean, the NBA regular season is worthless now. I saw where uh, Joel Embiid sat out again against, uh, um, uh, what's his name, from the Nuggets the other day. It's like the NBA Regular season is just completely worthless, it seems like. And it's like, well, when Kansas City, you know, sleepwalks through the regular season then flips the switch for the playoffs, are they devaluing the NFL's regular season? Fair question. Um, by the way, Betty Powers says she agrees with me. What I don't know is what Betty agrees with. Was it one of my astute Georgia football takes or was it my uh, half-witted breakup prediction? Um, Barry Watkins says that uh, Taylor Swift and uh, Travis Kelsey are engaged. Man, they ain't engaged. They ain't getting married. Um, let's see what else. Um, so now Jacob O'Neill does like his 10 hours of commercial free football uh, on Sunday. So there you go. Yeah, I probably get – I'm probably, like I said – I'm trying to be in front of a TV 3 p.m., and I'll watch the 1 o'clock straight through the finishes, usually check out a little bit, because I also I got kids, right? I mean, I got to, you know, not, not that I don't have to. I want to, you know, do stuff with them. So we'll end up, you know, playing around or something, and I'll kind of maybe check back in as, like, the as like the, the 415 window is kind of rolling into prime time. That's usually about what we do. Um, 
Yeah, Betty says she agrees with me on the breakup. Well, Betty, I'm glad to know that. Appreciate that. Um, Jacob O'Neill says, never mind. Make that eight hours. I'll be taking naps, too. Yeah, boy, I, I do sometimes like a little nap. I'm not a great napper necessarily, but, boy, I do love a little red zone nap where uh, you just kind of sort of move from game to game and it all kind of runs together, kind of clears your mind, and boom. If you can, if, That's a good way to nap if you can. Some of you like to nap to golf. I probably, uh, you know, I, I like watching golf on TV. I don't necessarily think of that as sort of nap fuel, but uh, but I know a lot of you like to do that too. Um, Johnny Prescott wonders if Taylor Swift might show up on Dog Nation Daily as a guest sometime soon. Maybe that's the case. Maybe that's the case. Um, seen several references to Morris Day and the time on the show today. I'm not really quite sure what that's about, but that's kind of nice. Certainly a welcome thing for me. All right, final comments, then we are going to go. Uh, DT says, the pre-recorded shows average 45 minutes. Today it's two hours. Uh, yeah, listen, we try to give you full, you know, full freight show after being gone for a while. Um, uh, Scott Harris wants to do a dog nation invasion to San Antonio for the Texas game. Yeah, that's tricky. We're going to try to figure all that out. Um, obviously, uh, a big game like that requires big stuff, and we'll see what we can provide for you here coming up on that at some point in time. Uh, but everything's on the table, I would say. Um, Jay Shipe says, where am I reading those cheesy comments from? So Jay firing shots at the other comment sections, as has come to be expected. Uh, Spencer Clark says that Jalen Hurts might be a Falcon. Is that true? Is that true? Um, Frank Patterson says the Facebook uh, commenters talking about Taylor Swift is very on brand for them, which is very funny. Um, oh, croaking one twenty three about the uh, Bama game on Wednesday. So I actually have a previous obligation. I'm not going to be able to go, but I heard that Stegman Coliseum was rocking for the LSU game. I would obviously we're all disappointed about what happened against Florida. I totally get that, but I'd love nothing more than to be there for the game against Bama. But I have a previous commitment that's going to require me to be away. This is a very busy time of year for our family coming up. So um, there is that. Um, all right, we're going to go. Hey, y'all, check out R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. That is what R.S. Andrews is all about, including heating systems, getting it tuned back up to factory fresh specs. Or if you start thinking about, you know, we're into January now, you blink your eyes, it'll be spring again. Go ahead and get that air conditioning unit. Be thinking about getting that taken care of there, too. Plus, plumbing issues, electrical issues, all that kind of stuff. R.S. Andrews has got you covered. So y'all have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. R.S. Andrews, cool down when it's all said and done. And then Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door Georgia prior to all of that. We will look forward to talking to you then, everybody.